next three weeks, we're going to explore parts of the history in the UK, some of which are a bit shady to say the least, like the opium wars, tea smuggling, and then there's the myths and the social attitudes around tea drinking, um, plus the traditions and etiquette. But where did it start? Where do we start? Do we know what tea is? <clears throat> Well, to help us with this is Katie Woolard, the product marketing specialist at Withard of Chelsea, working with tea, coffee and hot chocolate. She has 10 years experience in the tea trade, speaking this evening as an independent tea specialist. Katie, you're very welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me tonight. I can't <laughs> wait to talk about what my passion. <laughs> <laughs> um, in your case, what does a tea specialist, what does it involve? Um, so tea specialist for me is to be able to, to really understand the history of tea, where it's come from, what it tastes like, uh, to be able to explain individual types of tea. Uh, but to, to be really honest, it needs to it needs to be have a lot of passion because you need to tell the story of your product. And, and I fell into tea by accident. But uh, I, as soon as I started to learn about tea, I realized that this was a subject I want to teach. Um, so I wouldn't quite class myself as a tea master as that is a very respectful position to have and I have only been in the tea world for about 10 years and you need to really be a tea master for many more years on that uh, but I am a tea specialist so I talk about tea, I train tea, um, I taste tea so it's one of the best jobs in the world. Um, <laughs> so essentially I, I just need to be able to impart that knowledge of what I've learned over the last 10 years. Hey. Can you tell us some of the different aspects of your job? You just touched on a few there, but tasting. What other, what other types of things do you do? What does your job entail? So within my role um, at Wittard of Chelsea, I uh, support um, teaching all of our stores and all of our staff all about what tea is and where it comes from. And I've recently taken on a wonderful aspect of learning uh, and teaching uh, our entire company about our coffee and our hot chocolate as well. So both I get to drink in great quantities, which I enjoy. Um, but I will also uh, support to talk to partners, um, to customers. We really, really need to be able to explain to the customer what tea is and where it comes from. And there, there is much more, uh, like a much bigger respect for the product as soon as you start to talk about its background and also how to taste it. There's many different ways of making tea, all very controversial because everybody's got their own way of making it. But there is a few rules that we need to kind of respect and understand. So that's a big chunk of my job is actually to explain how to make it, how the best way to taste it and where it comes from. I'm just thinking if you're tasting coffee and tea and hot chocolate all day, you must be buzzing. Do you not get, I mean, does it not affect you all that caffeine? At the amount of meetings I'm in, that the, I have a cup of tea and by the end of it, it's gone cold and I'll still drink it. So actually I drink a lot of tea when I am teaching and I'm training because I'm getting everybody to, 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 you know, to breathe in all the beautiful aromas and taste them. But actually on a daily basis when I'm at my desk, um, I probably get through a handful of cups of tea and very only half of them will be hot by the time I get to them. Okay. It's a busy job being a tea specialist. <laughs> How did you get into the business? I mean, what took you there? Uh, by accident, really. I, I've, um, I actually wanted to become a blue badge guide because I love history and I love everything about history because it's a true story. Everything is real. You can't go back and say, oh, that was fabricated. Well, maybe the winners always fabricate a bit of their stories, but it's fascinating. And um, I came across a role where I could work uh, within Twinings in their oldest store which is 216 a strand and um once I started working there I realized that tea had such an incredible history it's 5,000 years worth of history there um, it touched all elements of society it changed technology um, it, there was wars fought over it and I found it fascinating and I found my true calling so as much as I still love my history actually I just fell into this idea that I, I wanted to teach tea. I want to learn about tea and teach tea. And um, roughly about seven years ago, I moved over to Wittard of Chelsea. And this has been my home now uh, for, for just over seven years. And 
I love working there. I have, I have an amazing team and it really is like a family. It, we just want to be able to talk the way I'm talking now to everybody and just say, Do you, have you tasted this? Do you know where it comes from? Do you know how it's made? Uh, wonderful job to have and wonderful people to work for. Okay, I mean, I get from have, having talked to you before um, that it is a passion of yours. You like, you can just keep on talking about it because you love it. Um, but before you kick off, I wanted to ask you, because you've tasted so many um, and you're privy to probably tasting lots that we wouldn't normally taste. Um, what is your preferred way to drink tea and what tea do you drink? Right, so there is the way my partner makes tea, which is a tea bag and milk and an English breakfast, which is what happens most of the time. But if I'm having a special moment and I really want to have a special tea, I, I love Gemaicha, which is actually a green tea from Japan with rice that runs through it and it's slightly toasted beautiful tea uh very moorish uh kind of a very umami flavor so it's one of those teas as soon as you start sipping you can't stop but it's also quite savory so mm -hmm. it's a really nice and easy drink to drink and i will actually usually brew it a gong fu style which is actually a very tiny teapot and you only use one teaspoon in there and you fill the teapot up and empty it very quickly because you wash the leaves and then you brew it again and only brew it for 30 seconds a time and then you serve uh, and actually it's it's a really beautiful way of having tea because it's about communication you're talking to your guest and you're serving but only very small amounts so you're constantly brewing and making so that's my way of having my tea at home my okay. special occasion sounds lovely um right um just for any of the audience watching if they want to make comments um or ask any questions at all please feel free to use the chat um and also if you want to ask a specific question there's the q a box below um so either way i'll pick them up and as katie is doing her talk and telling us all the vast things about tea that she's going to talk about. Um, I'll interject sometimes, Katie, if that's okay, and, and okay. ask some questions, um, and we can just let you run. So if you would like to take it from here. Sure, and feel free to ask questions at any time. I am a specialist, uh, but there will be things I don't know, but there is also a lot I do. But also one thing that I do want to add in very quickly into the talk is, Tea has got 5,000 years worth of information and history behind there. And also tea itself is such a wide subject that I could literally do a whole school season on this particular subject. So today I'm really touching upon a few really fun facts to learn about the tea and tea trade and kind of where we are at with tea at the moment and how we're drinking it and how we can help the trade as well. So um, if you feel like I've missed anything out, I know that we've got a good few sessions coming in the next few weeks that you can sign up to. Um, but uh, I would just say, please feel free to reach out to me um, afterwards if you do want to learn more about tea. So let me make sure that I can share my screen and make sure I pick the right screen. Um, I was just going to say, Katie, while you're doing that, what is, uh, who can they get in contact with or what is your email? And I'll put it up on the chat. Yes, so I, my email address is uh, katie.woolard, so k-a-t-y dot woolard, which is w-o-o-l-l-a-r-d at wittard.co.uk. Okay, thank you. I'll put that up. Cheers. Perfect. So can you see just my screen? I can. Looks great. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we've introduced uh, myself. I have worked for uh, the tea trade for 10 years now and currently work for Wittard of Chelsea for um, seven years now. We are actually celebrating our 135th anniversary this year. So we're very, very proud for our birthday. Um, but like I said, it is a massive subject and it could take me years to talk about it. And I'm well known for being quite a talker. So I will try to keep this um, as close to my slides as possible. So my first question is, what is tea? So what is tea? Most people drink this uh, tea plant all the time. They never question it. In fact, it's one of my favorite questions the moment someone walks into the store and you say to them, okay, so what is tea? And you get quite a lot of blank faces. 
So tea is actually a plant called the Camellia sinensis. It's an evergreen plant that likes to live uh, around the equator. But what most people don't realize is that actually it is a tree as we can see in these two pictures here. It's actually been cultivated over many thousands of years to be a shrub, but actually left alone, the Camellia sinensis can actually grow to many meters high and actually live well over a thousand years. And actually you can go to places like Yunnan and in Japan where you can actually find tea trees now that are well over a thousand years old. Uh, the camellia, most people, if you're gardeners, will recognize that name because there is a relative that you will have in your garden with beautiful flowers. But the camellia plant itself or the camellia tree um, originates uh, from around uh, Asia, mainly South uh, China, North India. But most tea now is grown in many, many different countries, as well as Africa, South America. You can even find it in Cornwall now and as far away as Hawaii. Um, the particular trees that you can see here are actually in Yunnan in southern China, and these are still harvested in the same way, so in the traditional way. So people actually climb these trees to actually pick the buds uh, from these trees, which I find fascinating because a lot of people actually think of tea as being a shrub. Uh, and as you can see, they are very much not. So like I've said, you can actually now harvest the tea tree or the tea bush in these well manicured and looked after fields. So these are our tea fields are now both in actually the uh, bottom picture is in Hawaii, uh, which is quite incredible to think that tea is grown there. When I say that the these are cultivated into shrubs that are easy to be harvested, um, it's a quite a deceiving word to say that it's easy because most of the landscapes where the Camellia sinensis likes to grow are anywhere from 700 meters right up to 2,600 meters. And the terrain that they grow on is very, very rarely flat. Really, if you went over to Africa and you've got beautiful big plains where it's quite flat, it's a little bit more easier to harvest the leaves. But I have actually been to India and Sri Lanka and these hillsides are sometimes almost vertical. So you have to be quite a strong individual to pick these leaves. Plus most people don't realize that you have to pick between 18 and 36 kilos of tea a day, uh, being a tea, uh, tea picker. And actually out of every kilo of tea, you'll only actually get around about 100 to 200 grams of dried leaves. So there's a need to be able to pick that much as well. So you can only call a tea a tea if it comes from the Camellia sinensis plant. Everything else is made from dried plants, herbs, fruits or spices, and we call these fruit or herbal infusions. And actually, this is a really big deal because it does affect your body. And also it helps you know exactly what you want when you go into a store. Any tea store will have infusions as well as tea. So what do we mean by this? So tea itself has many different chemicals, including caffeine, and so do infusions. So tea contains green, sorry, tea contains green tea. Tea contains caffeine, and most people don't realize that actually even decaffeinated tea contains a small trace of caffeine in there. So we have to be quite we have to kind of understand what we're actually consuming. So if you are allergic to uh, tea or caffeine um, or you're slightly sensitive to it, even decaffeinated tea will have a small trace on it. So actually, this is where herbal or fruit infusions are much better for you. Uh, tea itself is incredibly healthy, but if you do have this problem with caffeine, uh, fruit and herbal infusions are brilliant because 99% of all of them will have no caffeine at all. The only products that you will find to have caffeine involved will probably be a yerba mate, which is a South American drink. It's actually a plant which has got a high amount of caffeine, but most fruits uh, and herbs will not have 
any caffeine at all. And therefore, it's great as an alternative to a sugary cordial. Uh, it can be drunk any time of day or night. But one thing I do want to mention about tea is it does have a vast amount of minerals in there. Uh, you'll have, a, a, you know, folic acid in there, minerals, um, just anything you can think of which is really healthy is in there. I'm not going to talk about the scientific side of that here today because it's quite controversial and not as much testing as you would think has gone into exactly the true amounts of uh, vitamins and minerals that are in tea leaves, but it is an incredibly healthy product. So from tea leaves or the Camellia sinensis leaves, all the tea that you drink comes from that one plant. So the Camellia sinensis plant can actually give you white tea, it can give you green tea, yellow tea, oolong tea, black tea and poor. So again, this is another reason why this is incredibly important to talk about, because many people actually think there is a, a green tea plant, a yellow tea plant, and actually it all comes from the same plant. And it's all about how we actually manipulate the leaves after uh, the leaves have been harvested. So if you want the most light and delicate and untouched by man, we would always recommend a white tea. This is simply just picked and dried and therefore all that uh, nutrients, all the minerals and all the caffeine is still retained in those leaves. Very light and easy to drink. Uh, particular tea. And then you can go right down to the bottom there where we have a poor. This is actually an aged tea and it can be aged anything from two to seven years right up into 150 years. So it's quite an incredible tea to be able to experience. Very earthy, very much like walking through the woods during a um, kind of a rainy season, that very earthy uh, flavour. I love it personally. So it is quite fascinating to think that all six varieties of uh, tea, teas actually come from the one plant itself. So where did it all start from? Where did this Camellia sinensis plant come from? So like I said, originally it was from China and actually this is a beautiful picture for two men that are actually harvesting ancient tea trees in the province of Fujian in China. And this photograph was actually taken by John Thomas in 1870 and shows two men with sticks. And they're actually, you can just see in the trees, a few uh, ropes holding a, uh, a big basket up in the trees to be able to harvest the leaves. So originally, the tea plant was first found in China and it was found by this gentleman. This gentleman is the um, iconic emperor called Emperor Shunan. And actually it translates literally into, into to divine farmer, if I can say it properly. He is actually recognized or is um, kind of legends around the idea that he is responsible for writing down and um, explaining most of the agriculture that you can find in China now. So herbs and spices, fruits and plants. Um, he is the individual that was responsible to actually find all of them uh, that was actually growing in China. So Emperor Shengnan apparently loved his water to be boiled, so it was pure when he drank his water. And he happened one day to be sitting underneath a tea tree. And as the wind blew, these leaves fell into his water and actually changed the liquor of the water slightly darker. But he didn't realize this. And once he actually drank the water, he found it incredibly reviving and uplifting. And um, kind of he thought it as a medicinal uh, properties kind of inv invigorated his body. And from that moment onwards, we have an understanding of tea. So whether we actually believe he was sitting under a tree and this happened, it certainly centers all around this one gentleman. So we have here a map of where 
the tea plant originally originated. So we have Yunnan here, which is highlighted in the bottom, but actually the tea plant comes from Southern China. So where we have Nepal, North India, Yunnan and Vietnam, all this area, this is where the tea plant originated. And actually, we have two varieties of the plant that we drink. So we have the Chinese variety called the Camellia sinensis sinensis, and this actually means uh, Chinese Chinese. Very tiny leaves, loves to live high up in the mountains, uh, a light and delicate uh, tea. And then we have the Camellia sinensis asamica. And the asamica can be found quite low in the valleys. It gives you quite strong, bold, multi flavor. And it's exactly what you would recognize when you think about having maybe an English breakfast. But actually, as much as we call the sinensis, sinensis the Chinese Chinese, we've actually recently found out that the plant grown in Yunnan where the tea plant was first found was actually the North Indian variety, which is actually the Asamaka plant. So don't be fooled by their names. The two plants don't understand um, human borders, they grew quite naturally over time and spread either into the valleys or high up into the mountains. And that's where we get the two varieties of tea plant. So what do we do in between 27, uh, 27, 37 BC up until the 1600s? Well, there is a great deal that happens here. But a lot of it is to do with trade and the transformation of how we actually drink the plant itself. So one of the things that changes over this period of time is that actually in mainland China, we would actually drink the tea as a powder, as you can see here. This is matcha. This is a traditional way of having tea. So it was, an, uh, it was a common occurrence to have right up until about the 11th century to have tea in a powdered form. It was only past the uh, 11th, 12th, 14th century that we actually find that China stops using this process and actually starts to brew the leaf as a whole. But actually in Japan, they would carry on this practice. And this is the reason why Japan is very famous for its absolutely excellent matches. Because the actual knowledge of tea and actually growing tea was brought over from monks from China into Japan because they believed it actually helped them meditate. The whole process of growing the plants, um, grinding the leaves and actually even cutting every vein of the leaf out so you didn't get any of that bitter flavour through all helped with the knowledge and understanding of growing the plant, consuming the plant and actually the caffeine helped with meditation. So it was very much part of a, a Japanese monk's um, habit and process of their daily life. Um, and that's where we see very much a difference in, in China drinking the whole leaf and Japan actually drinking the powdered version. So we're jumping quite a big time over now, because like I said, the history of tea can go on for quite a long period of time. But when we think about tea and the rest of the world, yes, China cultivated the tea plant, spread it to Japan, Korea, Indonesia, and mother, many other uh, Southeast, East, Southeast Asian areas. <laughs> uh, it would travel mainly over to the East for religious region, reasons, uh, like I just mentioned, over to Japan for um, the Buddhist monks to be able to use. But actually, tea uh, going West was for trade. Tea didn't fare very well traveling long distances, and it could be months on end on a ship to actually get back to Europe. And actually, this is the reason why black tea was actually developed. It was developed for long distance travel. Uh, it was heavily processed and heavily dried, and it allowed the uh, tea to actually be quite fresh uh, once the tea was actually uh, delivered to its port. 
one of the things that I find quite fascinating about tea, because we always think that tea is quite quintessentially English and that tea uh, is really kind of something we do all the time, which we do. But actually, tea drinkers in England, we were quite late to the game. Tea was first brought to England in 1657 by the East India Company, and it was sold for an incredible high price. In fact, it could be anything up to a year's wages for most people, and tea sets could come anything up to, uh, in today's money, around about £10,000. So it was an incredibly expensive item to buy. But we didn't actually get tea uh, till late, but America did. And this is the thing that I always find really fascinating because a lot of people don't think of America and drinking tea. But actually, the Dutch first took tea to America because they had a, a small colony called New Amsterdam. And in 1650, they received tea. We now know this area as New York, and they got tea a full seven years in front of us. And I find this quite a fascinating idea, especially if we think about uh, America now and the heavy consumption of coffee. But actually, their experience of tea came well before ours. And one of the reasons why I picked this particular picture you can see here as a, um, a tea clipper here was tea was so in pop, uh, so popular during the 17th and 18th century that actually it changed the shape of ships. It literally changed the technology on how that we could get our spices, including tea, all the way to Europe the quickest way. If you landed your tea into port the soonest, you would be able to combine command the highest prices and actually every ship that came in after they would get less and less for their tea so it was an absolute must that you got to port first and actually the beautiful tea clippers that we see in these pictures were vital for this trade and I found that an incredibly fascinating subject. This particular subject we're going to talk about now is actually quite fascinating. So most people think of afternoon tea and high tea as high tea being uh, an extraordinarily um, well-to-do thing and then afternoon tea to be the uh, same value to it, a, a very well-to-do uh, thing to do in the afternoon maybe as a, a gift for a loved one or very much about the upper classes enjoying a spot of tea. But actually there is a great difference between the two. Um, it, Anna, Duchess of Bedfordshire, was the lady that actually introduced having afternoon tea. So we've gone from the 1650s uh, right up until now the early 1800s. It was quite a normal idea to have only two meals a day, one very early in the morning and one quite late in the afternoon or evening, roughly about eight o'clock at night. And they were big dinners as well. They were big meals. But in between, you really didn't have much to eat. And if you can imagine the ladies in waiting uh, with big dresses, um, quite a lot of clothing on and not much to eat, it would become quite a normal thing to say that they would feel quite lightheaded, um, fainting would be quite normal. And actually, Anna, the Duchess, the seventh Duchess of Bedfordshire, was said to have complained quite often of having that sinking feeling during the late afternoon. And so therefore, she developed the idea of having uh, a little bit of food with tea because she was wealthy and she could afford these items uh, to be delivered to her boudoir, her room, her private room, so she could have a little something to eat in the afternoon to keep herself going until the main meal in the evening. Uh, this quickly took on to other ladies in waiting or ladies in um, high places. And it was quite the in thing to do to be able to welcome your guests into the house and to be able to consume 
beautiful, very delicate sandwiches and cakes, but also consume this incredibly expensive uh, beverage, including having uh, beautiful porcelains and also sugar. Everything showed status here. It was about saying, look at me, look what I can do. I can afford this. Um, and it was a great way of showing your family's wealth. Okay. Sorry, I just wondered, what do we know what types of tea they were drinking? So actually, we would have had um, green tea originally. Uh, it would have come over maybe in the 1650s. Uh, but very quickly, the idea of developing black tea came over because it survived better in the journey. Because green tea is only very lightly um, uh, processed and then dried. But it, it could add a little bit of moisture on the way over because it could take anything up to three months for teas to come to us where black tea is heavily dried and heavily oxidized so the flavor wouldn't alter too much over time mm -hmm. but one fascinating thing as we think about these ladies that we see in the picture here is that actually when we think of tea caddies we would always have two boxes in a bowl in the middle and actually a lot of people think that bowl in the middle is to do with sugar but actually it was to blend your own tea so you had have some green teas and some black teas and it depended on your flavor of the day uh, and how you felt that you would blend your own amount of tea within your blending bowl so actually that's a fascinating side to tea caddies so if you have any at home please look at them in a slightly different way because that is a blending bowl in the middle I'm sure at a later date it may have been used for sugar but that was the original use for the bowl in the middle. So I'm going to move on to afternoon tea because actually afternoon tea turns into uh, high tea and high tea is not a more uh, kind of exquisite version of afternoon tea. It's quite reverse actually. It was for the working man, uh, the working family to be able to come in and have a well needed calorific intake late in the afternoon. So where ladies, it ladies of the day would have a little snack around about 4 p.m. It would be quite normal um, for high tea for the lower classes to be having that a bit later, about five or six o'clock. Um, obviously, this, this could change from family to family, but it would actually be named after the table that they sat at. So where ladies, it, ladies of the day would sit on chaise longs and beautiful small chairs with beautiful tiny tables. Um, the working family would sit at their dining tables, usually on benches, and they would sit down and have a meal very close to what we recognise as maybe a ploughman's. That's probably the closest experience that we could have of it today. So it's anything that the family would be able to um, create or grow within their local area or be able to make in the house. So cheeses and hams and breads um, and very, very kind of poor tasting tea. But that's quite an important part of, of social life that I think we need to recognise. So if you ever go into a hotel and they do a ask you if you want high tea or afternoon tea. Do question them and say, oh, do you mean high tea in the sense that it's going to be a hearty meal, it's going to be hot foods, or do you mean the uh, quite um, uh, higher um, echelons of society of having those dainty sandwiches and beautiful teas in exquisite pots? I think that's quite important for us to know the social background of those two particular interesting meals. So I'm going to jump again, not a few hundred years now, around about a hundred years to this gentleman here. Now, I find this gentleman quite an interesting uh, guy. His name is Thomas Sullivan, and he was actually a tea trader in New York in the very early part of the 1900s. And this gentleman is the reason why we have tea bags. So he would actually send out samples of tea to his um, to his customers for them to sample the tea because it was quite normal that you wouldn't actually travel to these stores. Uh, you may travel there once or twice, but then you would actually write um, a, an order and actually post it and you would have your products delivered to you. And in order for you to be able to try the new teas that he would have been given 
uh, out to his customers, it was quite normal to have small samples sent to you. And actually, Thomas Sullivan actually started to do his teas in small silk bags and sent it out to his customers. And the customers thought this was a wonderful idea because you could put these little bags in your teapot and there was absolutely no need to clean your teapot out or need a strainer uh, or worry anything about this. He didn't mean for this to happen. This was simply about samples to be sent out to customers. But quickly, his customers said, please, can you send my tea in this format because it's so easy for me to be able to drink and also have the perfect amount in the tea uh, pot and it's so easy for me to actually clean out my teapot afterwards. So in around about uh, 1906, 1908, the tea bag was accidentally created. So as you can see here, accidents and tea go hand in hand, whether it was Emperor Shunan in 2737 BC with the tea leaves uh, accidentally falling into his water, or whether it was uh, Thomas Sullivan accidentally putting his leaves in a bag for samples. Uh, tea and accidents, I feel, go hand in hand. And they're also, tea is also great for uh, kind of refreshing those nerves after any sort of incident. So, you know, tea, tea fits quite well in that circumstance. So, I want to jump forward now into the idea of what we do with our tea today and what we are kind of heading towards. So traditionally tea, uh, all from the one plant, uh, traditionally very expensive, but as the years have gone by, tea has become more and more affordable. But actually in England, um, we are quite old fashioned in the way that we drink our tea. And we haven't changed much in the last hundred years at all when we think about the way we drink tea, especially with the invention of our tea bags. But if you think about Asia and the fact that they've had their tea now for 5,000 years, there is so many other ways of actually being able to make or consume tea. So whether it's bubble tea that you see here up in the top left hand corner to poor tea here where um, it's consumed after a meal as it's traditionally culturally thought of as being great to help you digest whether it's beautiful foods you can see here with the matcha powder with the food, uh, cold brews are traditional hot teas or even our whisked matcha powder uh, made in these beautiful bowls. There are so many different ways that Asia uh, consumes their teas. And actually, if you look now, those habits are starting to come over to England, America and the rest of the world. Uh, I think that you will uh, all have seen bubble tea shops that have popped up everywhere and actually it's quite normal now to grab a bottle of cold brew tea from um, local shops and supermarkets. So habits are changing but we are still having this massive debate on uh, kind of what is tea, uh, what's the best way to brew tea. Honestly I think tea is individual. I think there is very good rules about how to brew tea. Uh, temperature and time and quantity needs to be kept closely um, watched upon if we're drinking tea in the traditional sense but actually tea is starting to break away from these traditional ideas and tea is being consumed in so many different ways and I would really um, ask you to go out and have a look at all these different ways teas are being produced it's quite an amazing way that tea is being re-looked at in the modern way. So how and what is valuable to the customer now? So we're talking about the fact that tea is being consumed in different ways now and in different ideas. And we kind of really need to realize that tea just isn't black tea with milk. There is an, a huge increase in sales of rare tea and unusual teas like white tea, yellow tea, pours. And actually many people don't even realize what these products are that you know you will use to your green teas you will use to your black teas but the uptake of social media has really helped the understanding of what we actually put in our bodies in in our our modern society um, many people are starting to realize that um, 
tea is a cool item to have. Uh, you'll see nowadays that the younger generations are less likely to go into a pub or a bar at lunch times or for social gatherings. You'll see that actually the tea, um, tea rooms, tea houses are having a renaissance. The idea of the younger generations, in fact, most generations now will prefer to go into a tea room and have a beautiful afternoon of enjoying a wonderful, rare, unusual teas and having uh, amazing food. And that idea that there is these unusual rare teas uh, that come from uh, wonderful sources is, is really a cool thing to do. And I'm really thankful for social media for that. I know that social media has many pitfalls, but one thing it is good for is promoting the idea of unusual and creative ideas to reconsume something that we recognize that is quite normal. So if you do get a chance to go and have a look uh, at all the different types of teas you can find out there and how you can actually uh, consume them. Also, to have a look at how you can cook with teas. Teas are not just something that you can drink, it's an ingredient. Um, have a look on Instagram and Facebook and see how many people are blogging about how they've used that in their cakes, in their chocolates. Um, it's, it's very much about uh, a new lifestyle. Um, I mentioned chocolate, but actually tea is looked at very much as a healthy uh, lifestyle. It's part of that new idea of I need to know what's going inside my body. I need to make sure that I'm picking the best and I'm drinking the best. And tea very much fits within that idea. So what is important to the new generation. So, you know, I've mentioned the fact that social media plays a huge part in this, but the new generation of tea drinkers, it's all about the most important word, it's origins. We are so interested, like I said, about talking about where our food and our products come from. And tea is no different from anything else that we're questioning. The word uh, for, you know, the origins, the, you know, the, the revelization, revelization, if I could say it properly, the revelization. Guys, I'll get that word out. The new idea <laughs> about tea is it's about teaching. It's about education. It's about learning something new. People are no longer interested in about uh, just consuming something because it's heavily advertised. It tastes good, but, you know, it tastes good. I don't care where it comes from uh, and what it is. It's all about the origins and the process of how it gets to our, our tables, the background, um, where it comes from, what country it comes from, who picks it, how is it harvested, has chemicals been used on it, um, how did it get from the estate to my supermarket or my store that I buy it from, um, how is it brewed, what are the techniques? All of these things are becoming more and more vital to the option for the customer. And actually you, you see it all the time now. If you look in any of your supermarkets or your specialty stores, you'll see that if and when they can put a story behind the product, um, they will do because it's essential for the customer to understand now this, this origins, this journey that the product takes on. And I think that it's incredibly important that tea and education go hand in hand. We need to understand the effort that it takes to get that tea leaf to your table. And that is another reason why we have to understand that tea itself goes hand in hand with the cost. So it's quite fascinating if you look about the fact that if you put a few pennies on a packet of tea, um, people get very upset by this. And I understand. I understand that money is money wherever you look at it. But actually tea, you really get what you pay for. 
the money you pay for tri tea trickles down through the entire journey right down to the farmers and actually that 10 or 20p that we actually in the grand schemes of things do not seem a great deal that we spend out of our pocket but has a massive impact to every single part of the journey of the tea plant and the tea picker and the tea industry. It's very important that we realize that we, you, you lose something. If you pay just a few pounds for a vast amount of tea, at some point you are losing the quality of the uh, tea or at some point someone in that chain loses something. And it's important that we make sure that everybody is looked after in the tea trade. And this is one of the reasons why I have this page up here. These are just a few snippets that I can show to you that people in different companies, not only my own, are so uh, energized with explaining the origins of their products and their teas. So, you know, whether it's myself doing talks in Chile, uh, in Taiwan, uh, in different parts of Europe, whether, and I'm a member of this, the uh, European Speciality Tea Association. They're an amazing non-for-profit group just to talk about the special uh, specialities of tea, the tea processes, how they get to the table. Uh, the UK Tea Academy, the London School of Tea, these are all people that want to talk to you about tea and explain it's not just a tea bag, you know, it's not just a few leaves. There is a whole uh, group, these whole generations that survive on the process of tea and how it's uh, brought from um, fields right to our front door. And I think it's an incredibly important idea that we keep in mind. Tea is what you pay for. Support those small tea estates, support ethically sourced tea and ask those questions. Where does my tea come from? How is it made? And never take, I'm not quite sure for an answer. You need to know what you're consuming. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this. If you do want to learn more, please let me know. Uh, these are all just little snippets in time that I've given you a little bit of a journey about tea. Um, but I hope this is kind of giving you a little insight of what tea is and where it comes from. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Really interesting. And um, we have a few questions. Uh, one from Mayumi. Um, she says, does the tea ever go off? Does tea ever go off? I'm so pleased you answered this, actually, because I've got some tea in my cupboard that is probably easy 10 years old. It is in an airtight container. Um, it's away from light and heat source. Um, and so therefore it can survive very well. If you're drinking tea that has got oils involved, so maybe like a, an Earl Grey that's got ber bergamot oil in there, it that will um, change flavor over time and it, it will disappear um, and tea will not taste that fresh after 10 years but it will not mean that it goes off so tea itself doesn't go off but it does have kind of a best before so you can drink tea 10 20 30 years if you want to old um, but I would probably say drinking tea within the first two years of its life is probably going to be the best option but don't do what my mom did I gave her when I first got into the tea world I loved my tea and I gave my mum all these different teas and she has her kettle underneath her tea cupboard so every time she brewed, uh, boiled a kettle the steam went up and one of the teas I gave her was a lapsang souchon and that's heavily smoked and after a period of time everything in the cupboard smelt like lapsang souchon uh, so I recommend that actually you get yourself little caddies airtight caddies and keep it away from a uh, light source and a heat source and you'll have tea for a long time. Okay, great question answered, lovely. Um, Tracy wanted to know, um, you mentioned at the start what your favorite tea was. Can you tell us that again? Because I think maybe people want to write it down. Yeah, it's called Genmai Cha. And so it's a, a beautiful, it's quite a, a dark green tea in the sense that it's quite umami. It's quite a seaweedy uh, kind of savory flavor. Um, but it's actually mixed in with um, 
with rice with with uh, beautiful cooked rice and so it gives you a kind of slightly nutty slightly hay like um probably not describing in the best way but it's such an umami flavor that i literally i just can't stop drinking it as soon as you start to to brew it this the aroma that comes off of the tea instantly is absolutely moorish so i highly recommend that you drink that one it's such an interesting one and also rebrew it never chuck your leaves away keep your leaves brew them uh, for between three to five minutes always remove the leaves so if you have a teapot that has leaves in there have a jug next to you so brew your leaves in a teapot pour the leaves out and drink them from there never let your leaves sit in for more than three to five minutes and then rebrew your leaves as many times as you want to until the flavor disappears <laughs> Lovely, good tip. Um, and also, if it's expensive tea, that's a good way, you know, to use it. You're not throwing it away. Oh, totally. And this is one thing that everybody is quite, um, tea bags have got a lovely price point, you know, they look not that expensive. You get a tea bag and you chuck it away. But actually, loose leaf tea, just because it's got a higher price point does not mean that you don't get any more value for like less value from it um i can easily brew, brew my get my char or my oolongs three four five times in fact my oolong teas i can brew anything up to seven times and i get probably four times the amount of tea out of a packet of loose tea than i would do a tea bag well i'm just while you were describing the taste of that tea there um i was imagining as a tea taster with other tea tasters like what is that like? Are you like wine buffs, wine tasters? Do you swish it, swill it, and then have a little and spit out? And is it like, oh yes, that's it. That smells like um my old grand's chess treasure chest, or you know, old box or whatever. No, 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 totally, totally. <laughs> okay. Um, so in order to become a tea taster or a tea buyer, um, you have to keep tasting teas for seven years constantly so you can taste anything from a few a few teas a week right up until maybe 300 teas a week you have to keep tasting and actually consuming many different products is great because you need to understand exactly what you're tasting you can actually find flavor wheels online and they will give you a breakdown on flavors because if you buy for instance for a buyer if you're buying say for instance assam you could be tasting 30 different Assams because they just come on the market and you need to understand what makes each one of them different and their price point and their value of why you would buy them. And so you kind of need to understand the flavor. Is it a bit woody? Is it a bit earthy? Is it malty? Um, is it acidic? Uh, it's, it, all of these words and everything describes it and at first you won't notice them and it's only when you start to sip and you look at the flavor world you go oh i can totally taste that in there you know a minerally element to it you know whether it, i know it sounds like a, a weird one to say but um you've got words like uh like the sea is ocean air or seaweed or cut grass or split pea all of these things that kind of give you a flavor of what you're experiencing and actually uh, currently uh on our Wittard website we've got a great little flavor profile wheel that you can go through to kind of find your favorite one based on a flavor wheel so it's a bit more fun don't look at the idea of tea is a green tea or a white tea it's all based on what you you drink and eat at home so it's a good experience cool another one question was um from kim she said do you like your tea with milk or lemon uh, do you know what I think? Um, and people will be like, oh, well, I love my tea with milk. I think the traditional idea of an English breakfast is it's um, I'm terrible for rushing about and forgetting to eat here and there. Um, I, I will always go and have an English breakfast with milk because it's just a pick me up and it fills me up. Um, but I do like it with lemon. I know that there's a controversial question about milk before or after <laughs> and again tea is a um, dividing topic this is but actually the science behind this is if you uh, put a splash of milk in and then you pour your water your hot tea on top you're actually heating the fat milk molecules in the milk and therefore it actually will taste sweeter so a really good tip if you're trying to get away from having sugar in your tea add the milk in first then pour in your hot tea over the top and it, it tastes sweeter and there's no need for sugar but if you're more of a savory person in i would actually say 
make your tea in your pot or your cup and then add in your milk afterwards because you're actually adding a cold product into the hot tea it cools it down it doesn't uh, change the fat molecules as much and therefore it'd be a much more savory cup of tea so there's no right or wrong on that one it's all about choice of flavor again right um one of the things that actually always surprises me that when I travel to certain places is like you can't get a decent cup of tea um and the only tea that's available are Lipton's tea bags what is that about why why are they around and then you don't get others it's cultural a lot of the time because uh, so for instance um you'll find that most tea companies um our tea company uh doesn't necessarily doesn't do this because everything comes from, from from the uk it's exported from the uk um but certain countries and certain companies will produce different types of tea for the flavor profile of each country because everybody has their own cuisine and their own kind of tastes and actually what will work for one country won't work for another country mm -hmm. um so it's quite important that we recognize that actually as as English tea drinkers, we know what we like, but actually culturally in a different country, that's not necessarily what they would drink. You know, um, if you go to France, for instance, um, uh, my family uh, live there and you ask for a tea, you very rarely get milk. It's quite regularly drunk black or with um, a slice of lemon. That's their traditional way of doing it. In England, we believe we're quite snobby in the idea that we created the idea of tea we drink tea correctly it's it's not it's totally down to the individual culture and how they're uh, how they taste so you will find tea tastes different in different cult, uh, countries but also as well the water will change each country has different water and therefore if you have the same tea bag or the same loose leaf in three different countries it'll taste different in every single country because the water will be different right yes makes sense um i mean one of the my favorite ways of having tea is the moroccan way which is like with the black bullet tea uh tea leaf and then um mint added in obviously they put a lot of sugar in usually i prefer mine with less sugar but i love the mint added to the tea it's really nice um oh that was what i was going to ask you is the tea that they use in chile for the mate tea is that actually from the tea plant or no not at all it's actually an infusion uh one of the rare infusions that have caffeine in so it's actually great that you mentioned this because um one of the things that i have experienced in my tea life uh is that uh, if it goes in a cup and added hot water it's assumed that it's a tea or that everybody calls it tea because it's hot drink we have to make sure that there is a big definition that tea is only tea if it comes from the camellia sinensis everything else is a herb spice fruit or plant and it's an infusion or, or a tisane um, and yerba mate is definitely one of those it's an it's a natural plant that grows quite abundantly in south america uh, and it is drunk actually different to tea because you'll drink it within um, kind of its cup with the straw and actually it's quite normal to drink the particles of the leaf uh, tried not to because it's the little straw that stops all the leaves from coming in but it's actually quite a social drink uh, but very high in caffeine so one of the things that we're quite passionate about is educating the difference between infusions and teas okay um another the thing I was like amazed about and really disappointed to find out was that a lot of companies use plastics and these little plastic uh, molecules in tea bags. Um, I only found that out last year, I think. And like one of the usual tea bags, I, I don't use them anymore. I know that they all companies don't do that. But um, why would they put plastics into into the tea bags? Um, uh, so it's actually all about how you seal the tea bag. So you'll notice that some companies will literally just have a little staple and a string um, because that's how they've sealed their tea bag. Other ones, if you have either um, pyramids or the round tea bags, they need to be sealed somehow. And um, it's been very difficult previous to actually have those manufactured because there wasn't a demand for it. So the fact that 
that they existed was it was quite an unfortunate thing that it was just taken for granted that that was what was done thankfully everybody has started to say I don't want this this is not what I want you know reduce my plastic uh, work out better ways and therefore the packing companies are looking at more and more ways to change these habits and I'm very proud to say that Wittards of Chelsea has made a massive change in how we package our products. Um, we, we've changed uh, so many of our pack packages to remove the plastics, uh, to have everything biodegradable, but also as well, really important fact for most people, when we say biodegradable, depending on what company, it's really important that you actually put in your tea bags in your food waste. So I, I know that our ones can go in our food waste and they are disposed of uh, uh, correctly. Um, because they are done by waste management. But depending on other companies, they might say biodegradable, but if you put them in your uh, compost heap, they might not break down for many years because they need a certain amount of heat to be able to break down. They are definitely biodegradable, but they will take a long time. So I'm very proud to say that our ones are biodegradable. They can go in your food waste and they can be responsibly uh, put away, um, you know, um, disposed of but if you look at all of our packaging now it's all going to paper or uh, plant-based um, synthetic so uh, I, but you know it's, it's down to people people are passionate and they want it to change and so we will change for them so it's really important that we make sure that carries on definitely um okay so we're about to wrap up but i want to ask you two last questions really um based on the fact that you mentioned bubble shops right I'm living in London. I've never seen any. Where are they? So when I say bubble tea shops, right, you okay. have to make sure there's tea in them. Again, that whole idea that anything's called a tea is tea. Okay. It's not. So so the bubble tea shops, um, they are uh, mainly uh, Taiwanese uh, tea shops. You can find a lot of them in Shaftesbury Avenue, uh, around Chinatown. Um, but I do know that there is a great deal of them dotted all around um, London now. Um, I love to have a matcha latte um, bubble tea because it's a tapioca at the bottom and then they make the matcha in really quite rich milk. I mean, it is, it is quite naughty. It is probably quite high in sugar. But the lovely thing about these bubble stores is it, you kind of get a look into what the modern idea of uh, tea is in Taiwan and China. It is quite readily drunk cold. In fact, if you go to Taiwan, you even have these made bags that you put your drink in and you cover it, have it on your shoulder to walk around with it. it's quite fascinating um but the bubble tea stores um are a, a kind of the newest way of looking at tea it's it's something sweet something fun uh but just remember when you look at the menu make sure it's not one of these really kind of outrageously aluminous drinks because you can tell it's not tea um but definitely try uh, a milk tea um, Charing Cross Road actually has got loads of little uh, streets off of there near Chinatown that do wonderful uh, drinks there. But see, just try it, give it a go, uh, and see what you like. It. I'm a bit addicted. I didn't want to be at first, but I am very much addicted to them now. Okay, great. So that's your recommendation. Um, so you'll be really happy when you see lots of people walking around in England with their plastic, yeah, their um, little cold yeah. brew bottles. Yeah, yeah, because tea is. Tea can be drunk hot or cold, you know. <laughs> Have it go down to Chinatown, grab yourself uh, an iced uh, black tea with lemon or a matcha latte. Um, you know, break out of the norms when it comes to tea because, yes, a beautiful English breakfast, as I have here in my double Nova mug, keeps it lovely and warm, is great. But to experiment it, try different ways. Uh, you know, we're just one culture drinking tea one way, but we live in a world of tea drinkers and they all have their own different ways. And I just recommend going out and experience each and every different way. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Is there anything, any websites or anything you want to share if people want to check out more? Yeah, so um, 
please come over to wittard.co.uk and have a look at our flavour quiz that we've got going online at the moment, kind of see some of the flavours we've got. Um, and also, if you are interested in masterclasses or learning more about tea, uh, please go and head over to either my email address or our customer services and they will pass over your info to me. If you've got any questions as well, I'd love to hear from you on there. Um, but also, I am a proud member of the European Speciality Tea Association. Um, and you can head over to their website. It's a non-for-profit group. It's all about the passion of tea. In fact, you'll find loads of people from many different tea companies all just talking about what's modern, what's trendy, what's traditional, um, you know, what's how do we make the tea trade as ethical and as, as responsibly sourced as possible. So it's a great place to go and be part of the tea world. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Katie, you've been amazing. Um, so much knowledge there. And I know, like you said before, you only touched on some of the things because it's such a, a huge topic. Um, so next week, we are delving more into the murky side and the history of, of, of tea coming to England and how it came here. So I hope you will join us again. Katie, thank you very much. Shahira, thank you very much. Um, thank you. That's it. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.